ex-CIA Stargate spy David Morehouse is calling out UFO whistleblower David Grush on the latest episode of the Danny Jones podcast. Let's dive in and see what this is all about. If you're new to the channel, y'all, and you like content like this, please hit that subscribe button. We put out a new video every day, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do not miss a day. And please hit that like button, y'all. That really helps out the videos. So thank y'all so much for the support there, vetters. And of course, comment down below. What do you think of these comments? Let's dive in. All right, I've got it uh, lined up here. Let's just start reacting real time. Let's go. What is your What is your opinion on this David Grush fella? The uh, the one everybody's calling a whistleblower. Yes. And he's talking about hey, he just recently went to New York and did some talk at some penthouse for some billionaire talking about how he saw a craft that looked like it was 40 feet from the outside. And as soon as you go inside the craft, it's as big as a football field. He we covered that. I'll put a link in the description uh, so you can check out more about that. Saying all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's there's off you know, planet beings. The rise of the con, man. It's like people can say anything. First of all, he's not a whistleblower. Okay, I hate that when people start calling people that are doing what he's doing, whistleblowing. He is a, what he is, is a purveyor of hearsay. Because, you know, only a few intelligent interviewers in listening to him rant on about, I know that, you know, we have captured alien craft. I know that we have alien bodies. And a few intelligent interviewers have said, you know, have you seen these? Well, no. Then how do you know? Well, I, I have some colleagues who are I trusted sources who, who do have personal knowledge of these things. And if they're telling me that, uh, that's what I'm, who are these people? Well, I can't tell you that. Well, there you go. So now all you are is a hearsay peddler. Now let's keep in mind, David Morehouse claims to be a remote viewer, right? Just want to keep that in mind. This person claims to have, you know, special powers and he's calling out David Grush. Just think it's, you know, context, not saying it one way or the other. Just important. I don't know. That's kind of important to keep in mind. So why is what he's saying is real and the stories he has and David Grush's isn't? It seems, inter it seems interesting. You're standing up expressing some degree of narcissistic, sociopathic tendency. Some might even say pathological. So you can get... Wait a second. Is he talking about grudge here? Pathological? So is that what? Con I mean, rise of the con? I don't like this language, y'all. But let's just be honest. Like, talking about grudge like that, I just don't see the point. Just say, hey, I don't know. I don't really agree with him. This seems like pretty, like you're firing shots here, man. You're attacking his sort of integrity and credibility in a way that seems very disingenuous and dismissive. Again, I don't know this gentleman. Maybe if I was sitting in front of him, it would be a different scenario. But just, you know, I listen to a lot of the podcasts. He seems very smart, very knowledgeable, okay? But this seems a little odd, right? Just, just saying. Your face on a camera, you can, you get this endearing public supporting you in what you're saying, but you have no proof, no evidence, and the fact that somebody, you claim somebody told you something, frankly, just doesn't pass the litmus test for us. And we have to be discerning about these things. Anybody can stand up in today and say anything, and the number of people who will actually turn around and go, I think that's bullshit, is minimal. Again, this guy claims to remote view, right? Um, all kinds of different places, time, time travel, remote viewing. I'm just saying, it seems very unusual to make these claims and then be like, yeah, people could just say all kinds of shit and they just no pushback. It's like, dude, what about you? Like in your claims, I'm just saying, has anyone pushed back on this guy and his stuff? I'm just saying, to be fair, if he's going to push back so hard on Grush, who's pushing back on this guy? Grush isn't claiming to be able to remote view and time travel, all these different things. You know, 
I'm just saying, if you were to put both side by side, one guy saying he has special powers, another guy saying he has evidence and proof of a mass government cover up involving extraterrestrial technology and the ET themselves. Now, they both seem kind of, you know, out there just from a standard reference point, right, of, of what we understand as reality and our knowledge, right? So I'm just saying. I don't know. Because everybody else wants to chime in on, especially if you're part of the UFO community. Mm. It's just like, you know, David Greer standing up and saying, Stephen know, Greer, Stephen Greer, sorry. In one of his documentaries, he stands up and right stares straight into the camera and says, well, yeah, because of my CE5, CE5 protocol, right? Which is, a bunch of folks in the desert sitting around in lawn chairs, standing up and, you know, staring up into space and communicating with their mind, right, is what he's saying, following. What are we talking about? That's what this guy, I mean, I just don't. <laughs> he claims to be a psychic spy and remote viewer. And he's sort of putting down this. CE5 experience again I'm not saying I'm a believer in that or that that is possible I don't know people claim to do it I'm a little scared to try it myself I've talked about that on here just because if it is real I don't know what I'm getting myself into um but this right I just don't understand this sort of judgmental approach to like, hey, yeah, what are they doing? You know, t communicating with their mind. Anyway, so back to my ability to be a psychic spy and remote viewer. That's totally real. I, I don't know. Uh, the guy seems super nice. Again, the rest of the interview was, um, it's quite fascinating. Look, if I could be real, Danny Jones podcasts are fascinating. Okay, because the production is really good. Audio's good. Right, you get these long stories. He does let his guests just kind of talk, and I, I think that is important, right, for these long form sort of interviews. And they cover a lot of different topics, so you know they're always nice to listen to and and to watch. Actually, I like watching them. Um, so anyway, just shout out to Danny Jones for production, um, and great just again letting your guests kind of get their story out. Um, so anyway, let's keep going here. This CEI, CE5 protocol, which is nothing more than a meditation is what it is. And he starts plugging in words like remote viewing and other stuff, mm. right? Trying to dovetail on some of those technologies. Oh, that's what you and do, he bro. claims that this was so powerful and so innovative and so amazing. He stood right there on a documentary and said, and oh yeah, sh you know, after we were doing this and having all this great success, he said that the that the the chief of staff for intelligence for army intelligence scooped him up off of the street in Washington D.C. and took him to a hotel. He's where talking about at Stephen the hotel. Greer right now. There were two Air Force officers and two uh, CIA agents, and that he was roughed up and interrogated, you know, very brutally, uh, or words to that effect, and that they told him, who do you think you are for developing this protocol? We didn't give you permission to communicate with the aliens, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do you believe one word of that? Wait, what? First of all... <laughs> Wait, what? I mean, to be, look, let's be fair, David. Okay, forced through the trees here. All of these stories, stories sound unbelievable, right? You, he tells stories in this podcast that sound equally unbelievable. So if we were to just put them all lined up, they all sound unbelievable, including this one, right? Yeah, that sounds unbelievable. Stephen Greer getting scooped up off the street and beat up in a hotel room and told stop communicating with aliens i mean what are we talking about here all right yes the, the there's a lot of stories like this the chief of staff for army intelligence is a three-star general 
<clears throat> a three-star general went out and took his weightlifting steroid ass and stuffed him in the back of a military vehicle and carried him away. He didn't say MPs grabbed me. He said the chief of staff of <laughs> Army Intelligence grabbed him. Oh, God. How does that happen? It doesn't. They that don't go funny. take people off the street, and certainly some three-star general doesn't go do it. Right. And he doesn't have a staff to go muscle people around and do something like that. So I would, you know, but nobody asks that question. Well, what was his name? You know, who were the guys that helped him, or did he do it by himself? What kind of car was it? You say he took you to a hotel. Okay. What hotel? Look at this guy, mm. vet. That's what name? I'm talking about. And if you're saying there were two Air Force officers in there, how do you know they were Air Force officers? Right. Well, if they had uniforms on, they have name tags on. And right. even if they're not wearing their jacket, they have name tags on. Who were they? You know? And what ranks were they? Okay. And Look, see, he's vetting. I mean, these are quite, it's kind of quite, you know, that's what I do, right? Start fi rapid firing these questions just like that. Exactly. I agree. Um, I think, again, as David Morehouse, as someone who makes claims like himself, when he starts asking questions like that, it's like, have someone done that to him? You know? Hmm. Maybe need to look into this guy a little bit more. I mean, he seems fascinating. I got to be honest with you. I agree with what he's saying right here. If I'm being honest. I do agree with this about Stephen Greer's story. I don't know if it's true or not, but those are, you know, pretty pertinent questions to ask. And he's right about all of that. All of those questions are exactly what I would be thinking to. I would be adding on to that. You know? CIA agents were there. How do you know there were CIA agents? Did they show you ID? <laughs> right? You see, but nobody asked those questions. And the whole UFO community accepts this as truth and it is not it cannot that's not true i mean clearly dude the whole ufo community is split seven ways from sunday all kinds of different ways all kinds of different little groups that'll come after you if you don't agree with one i mean it's almost impossible to get into this you got to pick a camp it's like barca or real madrid you know what i mean if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> or Manchester and I don't know, another team there in England that you, you got to pick, um, Liverpool. I don't, I, gosh, if I got that wrong, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it is not, mm -hmm. it's just ridiculousness, but here, you know, it's like I said, it's, we are in an age of the rise of the con. You okay. I'm just saying the, the, literally the title of this video is CIA Stargate spy remote viewing ancient Egypt aliens and space warfare. So this is the same guy talking about this, claiming this is saying rise of the con. I, I mean, is there some irony here? I don't know. Again, I don't know this guy's story like at all, to be honest with you. I need to look up more about him. Um, again, fascinating interview. Just saying it's just interesting to hear it from this guy, not just some other guy who's not making claims, right? You can just stand up and say anything. You can be that preposterous and draw a crowd. There will be an element of the population, just like Itzhak Bentoff showed you, mm -hmm. there will be an element of the population that will believe that just because it was said by a medical doctor. Mm an emergency medical doctor. I don't think he's licensed as current, but hey. Who, Greer? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it is, but maybe it is. Who yeah, knows? I get a lot of culty vibes from a lot of a lot of these people in the UFO community, especially people that are monetizing it. You know, people that are, they're making so much money from people getting, mem you know, paying for, I think he sells, he sells. He sells tickets. the CE5 protocol. I mean, Look, I don't agree with how much he charges for all that and what he does, you know, but teach their own. If somebody wants to pay for it, they pay for it. You know, if it didn't work, he wouldn't be charging that. Clearly, people don't mind paying it, but whatever. You know, to be fair to the whole situation, OK, I monetize this channel. You know, we need money to, you know, continue to do this. I can't do this for free. You know. 
and Danny Jones is monetizing off of UFOs. He, he covers it a lot, you know? So we've covered a lot of his interviews on the show. So just to be fair, the whole situation, I, I mean, everybody's monetizing off of, but not in a malicious way. One thing I guess is, would be like, hey, I have secret information. And if you pay me, you can get access to that information. That's, you know, that's kind of whatever. Right. That's kind of grifty. Let's be real. That's bull. That's bullshit. This is more like, hey, in order for me to keep doing this production that I do and put up videos and whatever, you know, all the work I do during the week, create a community, you know, facilitate it, all of that. Y'all, I mean, y'all are the real heroes that show up and give it its strength. You know, without y'all, there is no channel. Right. So but the money has to be here, for you know. For me to be able to do this right. But I'm not saying, hey, pay me and you'll get secret information because that's just not going to happen. You ain't getting secret nothing from me. I like doing that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so just to be fair to the monetizing, it that, that is also broken. It's very nuanced as well, right? You got documentaries, books. Again, I have zero problem with those things. In fact, I prefer those things over anything. There's no drama. There's no, no, it's just entertainment. I can take it in, information, and I can decide what to do with it. You know, it is what it is. Oh, does he really? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, from what I understand, it's pretty pricey. I, I can't He's quote the exact C5. price, so you might, I say this, it, check me on it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's somewhere around $1,500 for this thing. And I have a copy of it mm -hmm. right here. And it, you look at it, and it's just laughable. What does that mean, CE5 protocol? Uh, uh, it means uh, the, it's like the from the movie The Third, the thing with Richard Dreyfuss and Devil's Tower. Close Encounters. What the hell was the, the name of that guy. movie? I can't remember the it record now. Record in the background. It was the that movie with Richard Dreyfuss where he starts, you know, mashing mashed potatoes around close and encounters close encounters so ce is close encounters mm, of the fifth, fifth kind, kind which is mind communication with aliens we're calling the spacecraft down but there are people who actually believe that that's what they're doing you know i don't know again dude you claim to be a psychic spy and remote viewer uh i'm just i'm just saying you know he talks about earlier in the interview, like training remote viewers and you can't hit them with the time travel stuff just yet. You got to let them develop and then you hit them with that. Again, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, right? It sounds interesting coming from someone who has his own claims to be this dismissive of these other claims. Now, I don't know. I'm just, you know, pointing that out. Um, but again, he's talking about Stephen Greer here quite a bit. Maybe they're out there in this, but they, they're always going to places where there are known sightings of probably space wars craft being re-entering for landing somewhere mm. and coming in at 18,000 miles per hour or 23,000 miles per hour mm -hmm. and doing what they're doing. And, but they believe that they're calling these craft down and into an, you know, to assembly to present themselves to them. And there are no controls and they're not trained. They just get this protocol and then they do it. And I'm not trying to be critical of those people doing that. They hang on. So he is saying, see if I understand this correctly, if I heard that right, he's saying that the craft coming down for the space wars, that's real. What he doesn't think is happening is that the people there in the field or whatever with Stephen Greer who were, who are, you know, communicating that, that they're not making that happen. He's just saying it's happening on its own, right? They're, they're fine. So he's saying that's real. Just to be clear. Um, okay. I mean, I guess if you're, if you're in this, you've got your own boundaries as well, right? Let, let's think of, uh, let, let's compare this to religion. Right. So when I was um, as an atheist, I guess I still am one. I'm not sure. I don't like labels. But anyway, you know, you could say to a believer, hey, man, we're almost the same. Right. Atheist believer, you only believe in one more God than me. The other thousands of gods you don't think are real. 
you think just your one guy, right? So it's like, right? It's like you're actually closer than you're further away. And in this sense, it's kind of that. Like he believes his thing, but the other gods he doesn't believe, right? You know, something like that maybe. Because again, just considering his claims, this is quite interesting. When a person stands up that is supposed to be have an intellect that they and they trust, I mean, when he went into that community, I mean, they thought that God had descended down, you know, to be with them because they had never had a spokesperson that came from, you know, that level of society. They were always, you know, former Air Force this or Air Force that or somebody else that was willing to step into that position and try to keep that community held together with promises. And, you know, he stepped in making the promise that he was going to, you know, rip yeah. this up and open it up and we were going to get some answers. And he, he, like everybody else, when he soon finds out that that's not going to happen, then you have to start exaggerating things. Mm -hmm. You have to start, you know, throwing up smoke screens. I'll give you another example. He goes to a, he, he, some, some guy that was in the air force, he could have been an officer. He may have been a senior non-commissioned officer. I can't remember, but he actually gets an audience with an air force officer in the Pentagon, probably a spokesperson for some staff division there. The implication is that these are the guys that oversee the UFO UAPs, but it, there's no indication of that whatsoever. It's just if this guy calls up and calls, a, calls in a favor, somebody, maybe this Air Force major or maybe an Air Force captain, just gets detailed to do that. So he sits down with them and listens to them talk about what their demands are, what they want and why it should be happening and they don't understand and they've been trying. And this Air Force officer uh, prepares what's called a memorandum for record. A memorandum for record is done after every conversation like that. There are probably five million memorandum for, memorandums for record, MFRs for short, it produced in the Pentagon from every office, from phone calls to staff briefings to interoffice agency communications. MFRs are like corpuscles, you know? Mm -hmm. They're it's a lifeblood in the military. It carries information. And so they are not they're rarely classified. And if they are classified, they actually go by another by another route because you might, they might say classified, and then every sentence that could be classified or every paragraph that has classified information would have, would have to have a classification mm -hmm. to the left of the paragraph, and then the number, and then the paragraph. And But once again, I'm sure what happened is that the individual that had the contact probably picked up the phone, called back in there and said, hey, I know you've done an MFR. Or the guy said, look, I'll do an MFR. I'll draft this up and I'll pass it. I'll pass it on, which is exactly what he would say. I'll, Thank you. Thank you for being here. I got everything here, I think, in my notes. I'll do an MFR and I'll pass it to the next, to the next officer in the chain. Right. And I'm sure that that individual asked for a copy of that MFR, which would not be an unusual thing to ask for. And if that MFR uh, was classified, he would never get a copy of it. Mm -hmm. But the MFR was not classified. It wasn't classified. And I, there would be absolutely no hesitation whatsoever for that officer who generated the MFR to send a copy to the two people that were there, you know, spilling their guts to him about what they wanted and needed. And it would say on this date, at this time, mm -hmm. <clears throat> these two what, people what the appeared in story? my office room, blah, 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 the E-ring of the Pentagon, and we talked for one hour on these subjects. They brought this to my attention, this, 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 and they made these demands or they made these requests, and my response to them was this. That's a memorandum for record. It's a record of the mm -hmm. conversation. Right. Okay. Goes you know, over his signature block, and... 
he would have had no problem emailing a copy of that. But how it's now couched to the UFO community is by Greer and the other guy, it's a leaked memorandum. A leaked memorandum, you know, of yeah. our conversation. That whole story was to explain that. I mean, I was waiting to see what, what was happening there. Okay, well, we're moving on uh, from that. So anyway, um, yeah, look, links in the description if you want to check out more about David Grush's uh, presentation that he had in New York. He did talk about this UFO that, you know, when he stepped inside, it was the size of a football field. I think they, um, what was it, a TARDIS is what the name was sort of spoken about. Um, and it's fascinating. Right. Um, remember, David Grush in that same meeting sort of let it slip that he is a firsthand whistleblower. Right. This that was supposed to be part of his op ed that's being held up in the Dopser review. Um, and. You know, he's also read into a program satellite imagery. They know the frequency of UAPs and they're able, able to track them. And that's the program he's been read into. That's the UAP program, which is odd that like what Arrow didn't include anything about that. Again, I mean, guess who cares about Arrow at this point? But more details about David Grush coming out and being a first-hand whistleblower need to come out because that's, you know, we just need more details from him about that whenever he's, I guess, ready to talk about it. Um, but... Let's just say for play devil's advocate here, what does constitute a whistleblower? If we were to find it lately on the channel, we've been talking about that, right? How do we define, you know, firsthand knowledge, firsthand witness to what, right? That's been a big discussion in the comments, right? I've seen people going back and forth. A lot of people do not agree on this. What you, you know, what designates firsthand knowledge versus secondhand, thirdhand, right? Um, an example might be you're at the scene of a crime, right? And you are there to witness the crime in person, right? Versus there's video of the crime and you're watching the video, you know, 20 hours later. Are you then, who's the, you know, are you both firsthand witnesses? Is the cop investigating that case that sees that, you know, security camera footage is he now a first-hand witness to the footage but someone then is a first-hand witness to the actual crime right and then i guess you can choose so there's different levels of first-hand knowledge even right so i don't know it's just a very interesting conversation so as part of this you know defining whistleblower we've been trying to define disclosure i saw in the you know um comments yesterday uh, video what disclosure means and again we've talked about it numerous times so i guess it does make sense to sort of define whistleblower what does that mean and are there i guess there's different kinds of whistleblowers right you've got your snowdens and you've got your grushes you know so it's like whistleblowing within you know whistleblowing within certain parameters versus just Blowing the whistle, you know, all hell breaking loose. Um, so I don't know, you know, but I think a lot of his criticisms of Grush, not really fair, right? He's not crediting Grush with saying, hey, Grush was an investigator, right? Assigned to a task to investigate this and put together a report on his investigation. Right? It's like a detective in that sense. So it's like criticizing the detective for being like, he, it's just all hearsay. He didn't witness any of it. It's like, well, yeah, dude, he's the investigator. He's bringing together all the witnesses, right? Now, again, now it turns out David Grush is a witness during his investigation. He was read into a program. I don't know if there's any conflict of interest. There's still more details to come out about that, but that is interesting, right? 40 whistleblowers. Part of, his, part of his investigation, or at least 40 witnesses. That doesn't mean they're all whistleblowers. I think that's important to remember, right? So 40 witnesses, or at least 40 people of interest on his in, as part of his investigation. I think that is getting a little confused where it's like 40 whistleblowers, but I don't think that's true. It's 40 
people of interest. And then the number of whistleblowers within that 40 is probably not 40. Let's be real. Okay. It's going to be a way less number than that. Probably way less than we want it to be. And the rest are just made up of different people that build the whole investigation. You know? So think of it this way. Think of it like, again, like at a police investigation. Let's just assume, right? You've got the, wit the, the direct witness to the crime. Maybe then you got the convenience store clerk that just heard it. Then you've got, you know, the sister of the convenience store clerk that took a phone call, you know, at her apartment because the, the convenience store clerk called his sister and said, hey, this is going on, right? So she's part of the investigation. Then you're talking to this, that, right? Maybe the 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 doctor of the the victim and, and finding out their history. Now they're a part of the investigation. Do you see, do you get my point? It's, it's, that's what David Grush's investigation, that's what those 40 people are. They're not all whistleblowers. People, you know, and then within those, that, that group, that number of people, you've got first and second hand whistleblowers and maybe third hand whistleblowers. So how many actually first hand whistleblowers that are part of this investigation meeting. And then again, that's not even defined. Are they actually people that put their hand on the craft? Or are they saying, I worked in a lab and I had a piece of something that they told me was ET, you know, piece of ET craft, but you never see the craft. Who has seen the craft? Okay, David Grush is talking about a, a, a craft so big that when you step inside, it's the size of a football field. So clearly that means they've, someone has done that. Who is that person? That's the only person we need to come forward and to tell their story. That's it. That guy. Get that guy out. <laughs> you know? So I think it is important to start discussing the definitions of these things. It's very important just to set our expectations because that's where disappointment comes from. Right? Disappointment comes from your expectations or lack thereof, right? It, it, you set them, they don't reach that, and then you're disappointed. So if we can be more realistic with our expectations, maybe we won't be as disappointed and we'll actually be a little more optimistic about things, right? Because we there is a lot to be optimistic about. There was legislation passed, okay, in the NDAA, right? It wasn't what we wanted, but hey, that's round one. It takes time. Okay, they're going to try year after year and keep pushing and pushing and get an office set up, right? Arrow, these things, they got new leadership. Maybe they'll come back around, right? That, you know, start to grow. Maybe another office, whatever, right? More things happen. The private sector getting involved more to study. More pushes from people like Danny Sheehan and what they're doing, right? Political uh, pressure on this. More Congress people getting involved. More field hearings, more public hearings. There's a lot of movement here. I mean, there is, right? Now you start to add up all the per millions of personal experiences across the globe. And, and this isn't including what all the other countries are doing, right? Then you put together stories like Tim Gallaudet, right? Rear Admiral of the Navy, Chief Oceanographer, coming out and saying basically, you know, USOs, you know, probably some of them are non-human intelligent, right? A lot of credible people. Again, it's just a lot to add up here. Right. So, but I think helping define some of these terms, um, is I don't think I don't see anything wrong with that. Again, tax dollars are asking to be spent. We're allowed to ask questions. Right. If, if people are asking me to contact my congressman, I get to ask questions. I don't just take your word for it. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. And don't ever feel bad for that. If you're watching or listening you should be allowed to ask these questions if you're in america right uh, for this right now or whatever country you're in if that's happening you should be allowed to ask questions about it tax dollars are going to be spent collectively our our money we get to ask about this stuff right so anyway you know interesting episode i enjoyed this conversation to be honest with you this was great Hope y'all did too. We'll see you guys on tomorrow's episode. I have um, an amazing interview with Pavel Ibarra. Okay, don't forget. It's going to be about uh, Dr. Jacobo Greenberg. Um, basically, Jacob Greenberg. I think that'll help you understand if you didn't, didn't understand what I said. Um, 
yeah, I can't wait to share that. Already started editing it. It's going to be nice, man. It's a great conversation. It's a great story. It's fascinating, honestly. Fascinating story. So anyway, all right, y'all. We'll see you tomorrow. Remember, every day is a gift, y'all. Peace, vetters.